Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E75. This is uh, Lecture 10, CSS. Today we have a uh, guest lecturer. This is David Heitmeyer. He's the senior software product architect and engineer. I needed a cheat sheet in so long uh, for iCommons as part of uh, central administration. He actually uh, lectures a number of other courses here at the Extension School, including, and again, a long list, uh, E153 uh, and S-L, which are in the fall and the summer, respectively, regarding XML in website development and advanced XML in website development, and E12 in the spring, which is fundamentals of website development. He goes over a number of things, uh, not the least of which is CSS, and uh, as you'll see, he's going to go over quite a bit of that today. So. I'll hand over the reins to him. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, good evening. Uh, I was actually uh, very delighted when uh, David uh, contacted me and asked me if I could come and talk about CSS. He was uh, uh, out uh, doing marathon things uh, today. Uh, so anyway, I'm uh, really glad to be able to be here. Um, everything that I hear about E75 is that it's a fantastic course, um, and that's uh, not at all surprising, um, given, given that David has uh, taken the reins of this. So tonight, we're going to talk about CSS, or Cascading Style Sheets. And it's really sort of the, um, of, of the if you want to call it a triad of, of what goes on, at least on the web client side of things. We have the markup, which kind of gives the structure to our page. We have the CSS, which will give the styling or the presentation to the page. And then the other piece that you've, you, that you've dealt with is uh, the JavaScript that really kind of gives the functionality to the page. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the CSS or the presentational aspect um, of the page. And one of the, the emphases here, and right now I'm just really kind of dealing with a separation between markup and, and style, but the, the same holds true for the, the, the functional aspect. Um, right, you as a web developer, um, and, and more importantly, probably the people that follow in your footsteps maintaining uh, the applications that you write are going to be much, much happier if those three things are separated. Um, and so we want to maintain some sort of separations of, uh, separation of concerns between those three types of things. Um, so it's fairly common um, to see kind of this commingling or intertwining of markup and presentation. Um, and so some of the symptoms of that, I mean, at least early on in, in the days of the web, uh, we kind of saw, saw these proprietary HTML extensions. Um, we see a lot of, of things that really should be text, making them into a graphic and then plunking that on the page. Um, we see a lot of use of these spacer GIF images. These are these one pixel by one pixel transparent images that can be stretched and to hold that page together just so. Um, uh, to, to, to using tables for layout. So um, it can get kind of messy that way. And if we get to it tonight, um, I, I kind of do a makeover of the Harvard homepage um, and, and show what could be done in terms of CSS. I will say that I have a lot of slides here tonight. They're, they're on the web posted. Um, probably not going to get to them all. Um, but I, I went ahead and included them anyway. And uh, they're, they'll be there for at least uh, to look at. So what are some of the consequences of, of this intermingling and intertwining of these things? Well, changing the design can actually be a major, major undertaking. When your content is kind of intertwined with, um, with the, the presentation, um, and, and it, it's even worse when the page isn't static, but it's driven by you know, either PHP or some other dynamic system, um, then you have your code possibly intertwined with markup, intertwined with layout, and it can get really, really messy. Our markup itself can be incredibly complex. Um, and it can be easily lead to errors when you're just trying to go make some simple updates. Um, a great story about this um, announcement that had to be added to um, this uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences uh, homepage. This is several years ago. Um, the timing of it had to be just so, because it was like the, the, the announcement of this particular award, and it couldn't be announced before midnight and Sunday. And, and so, and the text of it had, was very, you know, it has to say this and this exactly. Well, the main problem was the uh, FAS homepage at the time was designed with this intertwining uh, of markup and, and presentation. And that announcement was more than one line. And believe it or not, that just completely broke the page. Completely broke the page. And I thought, well, great. I'm going to take this opportunity, as I said to myself, 
Saturday afternoon. Fortunately, I, I had the foresight um, to actually kind of test this beforehand and, and realize, okay, this is going to break. And uh, thinking, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a web professional. I can fix this. And not only will I fix it, I'm going to make it better. I'm going to separate. Well, the fact is three, three and a half hours later, managed to actually separate out the markup from the, uh, from the CSS and could actually have a two-line announcement. So that was quite a, quite a major accomplishment. Um, so when things are separated, um, our structure and our presentation are separate. It becomes much easier to alter one um, without affecting the other. Okay. Uh, we have a lot greater control over the presentation um, than if we try to use our markup alone. Accessibility greatly increase um, the accessibility uh, to individuals who need it, but also to devices. I mean, more and more, you know, you have small handheld devices that are internet capable. Um, and those sites and those pages uh, that uh, kind of follow these principles will be much more accessible, um, not only in terms of uh, individuals, but devices. So those, uh, that's kind of my pitch as to why this is important. Um, and that uh, why we should kind of pay attention to this. Uh, some of the, the power of style sheets. Now, th uh, this takes a, the U.S. Constitution and uh, just took it in text form, did some very simple markup, okay? Um, basically divs and H2s and paragraphs. Um, and then take some of these these uh, style sheets that kind of are pre-existing uh, from the W3C and apply those. And so really the only thing that's different uh, between these is the existence of a reference to a style sheet. So you can see that we can fairly radically change the, how things look uh, simply by referring to a new type of style sheet. Um, Now, we can, it, gets, it gets even better than this. Because um, there we're just kind of changing colors and, and text. Uh, but we can kind of go a step further um, and really begin to do design and layout with CSS. Um, here's an example of the Harvard College uh, admissions homepage. On the left, you see it in its full glory. On the right, you see it with CSS turned off. Um, and so you see a, a couple the things that we see here, um, one is the use of headings and the other is the use of, of lists. Um, you know, it used to be the case that nobody wanted to use H1s, H2s, H3s to demarcate headings in a page because you didn't like how they looked. Well, CSS gives you full power, full control over how they render. And so um, if we take a look at the, the headings here that are circled on this page, Harvard College Admissions, Experience Harvard, Harvard Happenings, and notebook, those are all H1s, H2s, and H3s, I believe, um, styled differently. The other thing that we have going on in this page are the use of lists. Um, so we see the top navigation list, which is horizontal, is a markup list, right? One of those ULLIs, the thing that normally renders as an um, indented, bulleted list. Well, we can simply render them differently. We have two navigation lists. We have lists uh, under Experience Harvard. We have a list under uh, Notebook. And so when we take CSS out of the picture, we go back to our screenshot on the right, it's nice because our headings are headings and our lists are lists. Um, and so you would be able to at least get the information that you needed with a very, very simple um, device. Uh, that was much more text-based, had a very limited um, screen view, uh, and yet if we go to it with, um, with a full-fledged browser, we see that. Another example with uh, Department of African and African American Studies, again, primarily using headings and lists, um, styling those for navigation, styling those for headers and tables, and even embedding images uh, via the cascading style sheets. So we see that one page with CSS, the bottom screenshot is without CSS. The, the CSS Zen Garden, which is a site, it's definitely recommend that you go visit that at some point. Um, and here are some screenshots. And, and so the idea here, the CSS Zen Garden, they have a page, 
and they've given it some certain structure as, um, uh, with regard to markup. And then they basically invite people to submit um, uh, cascading style sheets or CSS um, packages that uh, will, will style that page differently. And here's just a, a very small sampling of screenshots of different style sheets applied to the very same markup. Okay, so incredibly different, but if you look closely, they're all the same thing. They all have the same navigation list, they all have the same headers, they still all have the same content. But simply by changing the, the rules as to how that markup is styled, we can get these radically different um, designs and styles. So we go from the pinnacle of, of CSS by design to my first example. Um, on the, thank you for that chuckle. Um, on, the, on the left is default rendering, right? We have an H1 that everybody can see this. We have an unordered list. We have some hyperlinks and we have some images. Um, and on the right, I've taken, and it looks much prettier on my laptop browser than on the, uh, the, the projector here. Um, we kind of have that same markup simply uh, just styled. So what are some things that we notice about them? Well, the, the fonts, uh, the font heading's a little bit different, color's different, we have some border going on there, we have a background color. Our lists don't have bullets anymore, um, and that's probably, and we don't have an underline um, with the links. So I just want to sc scroll down, so we show kind of the markup, and then the second uh, chunk of code here is the actual cascading style sheets. And the big picture that I want you to look at right now anyway uh, for this slide is that um, these are all the CSS rules that apply to that document. So CSS, it's a text document, and we basically have um, selectors, okay, so we see element names here, body, H1, UL, LI, IMGA. So those are, are the selectors that determine what the following rules will apply to. And then we have curly brace within the curly braces, then we have the CSS properties and then the values. So for instance, for the body, we're setting the left margin, we're setting the top margin, a right margin, and a background color. So that will be applied to all body elements within our page. So that's generally how CSS works. We have selectors, and we have properties, and we have values. And so it's just a matter of applying your selectors and choosing the right, the right properties and values to get the effect that you want. Um, so how do we, what are some of the specifics about that? Um, you should memorize this timeline. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, top, uh, th these are uh, a lot of the kind of markup milestones and specifications. Um, most of them coming from the W3C, not all of them. Top is markup, bottom is style. Main point with this, CSS has been around a long, long time. Right? This, this December will mark its 12th year uh, of CSS1 being, being released. Um, and there have been other kind of versions. So CSS1, CSS2, kind of in the 2.1, and CSS3 being worked on today. So the bottom line is, is that CSS is well supported in kind of um, current generation browsers. And, and, and even kind of if you go back um, a, a single generation. Um, so CSS resources, um, if you want more, uh, which I hope you will, uh, here are some sites that I recommend going. A List Apart, Simple Bits, Meyer Web. So yeah, Eric Meyer, is, he literally wrote the book on, on CSS. Just, just, these are on the slides that you get Yes, okay. yes. Uh, these are, uh, will be all on the, uh, on the slides from the course website. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you don't need to scramble to write them down. Um, a short list of, relatively short list of books. Um, uh, again, basically, the, if we take a look at the first book here, the uh, Haken Lee, uh, he was one of the authors of the CSS spec, and, and Eric Meyer, um, and Dan Cederholm. Anything that you get from those three people is going to be great. Um, and so when in doubt, go with one of those and you'll be fine. So how do we get our style rules applied to our markup? And there's basically three ways of doing that. We can use a style attribute 
um, that's with each element. Um, there's a style element that we can put in the head of our HTML page or XHTML page. Um, and then um, with the, with it, it contains the style rules. And then thirdly, we can refer to an external CSS document. Um, so just some examples of these. So here's an example. We have a paragraph element, uh, and we have a style attribute. In that style attribute, we're setting things like the color, the background color, the padding, the font family, um, et cetera. And then those style rules are applied to that paragraph when it's rendered. Okay. We can use a style element, and here we have a style element that goes within the head of our markup. Um, style type equals text slash CSS. And then the contents of that would be this, where we have our P selector, curly brace, a list of rules, close curly brace. Um, and so again, if we look at this, we're going to get the same thing. We've just kind of attached those styles a bit differently. And I'm going to open up the source here so you can kind of see that. So here, here are the rules that we put in into place. Lastly, then, and this is probably this is definitely the most powerful way of using CSS, is to simply refer to an external style sheet. So here, our paragraph element is just a P, no, no styles attached to it. Um, our style rules are in a separate document, in this case, example 3.css. And then in our head, we simply have a link element, relationship, style sheet, type, type text slash CSS, href example 3.css. So that href then refers to an external style sheet, and then the browser will go fetch that and see what the rules are that apply to it. Yes, Mark? Now, you can also get at an external style sheet by using a source attribute and a style element. Is there a difference, and what is the difference between using an external style sheet with a link element or a, or a style element. I spent some time looking through the XHTML spec trying to figure this out. I don't see anything intelligible. Um, right, so the difference between a source attribute um, for the style and a, and a link, to, to be honest, I don't, the, at least with the link element, that's the one that I see most commonly. Um, the, the, source at, the source attribute I see more with script elements, trying to kind of bring, bring those in. It, it works with style elements also. It, 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 it very well might work. I was, I was saying that this, this model is the one that you see more, more often uh, with that. There's also import statements, and there's a variety of ways to pull in external style sheets in. I think the, the, main, um, I think the main principle with, with this, however you bring in your external style sheet, um, it can be very handy to have your style rules in an external style sheet, um, and that can be really applied to all pages, um, static or dynamic, uh, that are generated on your site. And so you're guaranteed to have some consistency and have these style rules applied across every page. The minute you start putting you know, style rules within each individual page or even attached to elements, it, it becomes very, very hard um, to ensure that, it, that things are consistent. Sometimes you need to do that. If you have a page where you need to override some sort of style, that's what these things um, uh, these are four. But in, in general, very much like how you, uh, with JavaScript, if you have external JavaScript files that you can have every page refer to, as opposed to trying to code specific JavaScript within each single page. Uh, yes? Now, I wonder, what is REL stand? You said it stands for relationship, right? Uh, yes. What, what does that mean in this context? What, what's so, so there, there are other ways to use the link element. Um, so uh, link, um, REL for relationship, it could be alternate. Uh, and, and that could be a way to refer to, see, let's say, like an RSS feed for the page. So um, right, we aren't looking at kind of at the full use of this link element, just in this very specific case of how, how do we use it for a style sheet. But there are other uses of it. Uh -huh. And you can also use the link element for um, uh, to refer to the site icons, that would be another um, another use of the link element. Uh, that's a good good question. Um, so in in general, 
we're, we're going to want to uh, put our style rules in an external style sheet and override them only when necessary. And, and I want to make that point because a lot of my examples, I have it with the style attribute, um, but that's just to make it easier as far as learning goes. Um, and, and you often might code that way when you're learning or trying to figure out exactly how that style should look, uh, but then take the next step and put that style rule out somewhere else. Uh, so all of your pages can take advantage of that. So what does a CSS rule look like? Um, so we have the whole rule. In this case, we have um, it encompasses the, the, the P for paragraph, um, and then whatever's inside the curly brace, uh, which are all the rules. So um, kind of all that would be a, a CSS rule. Uh, so we have the selector. Uh, the selector determines what parts of the page um, these rules are going to apply to. So we have the selector and the declaration. Uh, within the declaration, uh, we, can have, we can define multiple properties and values. So here our we have um, really two rules within here. We have the setting the color property to red, to the value red, and the background color property to blue. Okay. So selector, declaration, within the declaration we have property value. Note too that the property values are separated by, um, I should say the property value pairs are separated by semicolons. And we go property colon value. White space is, is um, unimportant in CSS. Um, so the fact that there's a, a line return after the opening curly brace and before the closing one, that's just for visual effects. Uh, so the important thing is that we have uh, colon to separate properties and values, semicolons to separate the pairs. And I will say, whatever your last property value pair is, get in the habit of putting a semicolon there. Um, it's not strictly necessary because you have the closing brace, but inevitably is what will happen. You'll go in to put a third rule here and you'll forget the curly brace like I do all the time. So um, just a helpful hint, just Get, get used to putting that there. So if we have um, a list, say, and here we have um, all P selectors, and we're all specifying one, one rule here, we can take all of those and combine those you know, into one. And what we've shown here, top and bottom, is um, saying basically the, uh, saying exactly the same thing. So, yes, yep. Uh, so font family, uh, is, yep. what's the reason behind having more than one font? That's, that's a great question. We'll, we'll, um, the, the reason of having a list in terms of a font family is um, we, we don't know all the different fonts that are going to be available on someone else's computer. And so we're, with CSS, we're still dependent upon the installed fonts on whatever system is viewing the page. And so we want to basically give a list of choices, um, and then the, the browser that's rendering it will look at the first choice, and if it has that font available, it will use it. If not, it, it kind of goes down the chain and finds the first, first one. And that brings up the, the second point to that, is that we always want to end with the generic font family, uh, in this case, sans serif, um, you know, the fonts without the feet, uh, because every system will have at least one sans serif, one serif, one monospace, uh, and so we always want to kind of end with that. Hopefully, it'll never get there, but um, it, it's a good practice to do that. Another great question. We can also combine selectors. So if we want all of our HX uh, elements to be maroon, um, we can take all those, and our, our selectors, we have a comma-separated list of selectors, and then we have the, the declaration that applies to those. Okay. Uh, and so again, these two things are identical in their meaning in terms of CSS. So what we've seen up till now has, has always had a, an element name as a selector. Um, is what we can do is also use the class um, attribute and the ID attribute to, um, to, to be a little more specific in our, uh, in our selectors. So here we, have, um, here we have some divs where we've set classes um, with style class of worn, 
uh, span with a class of warrant. And then we even have a, an ID element here, legalese. So in our CSS rules, the um, class selectors are always um, selected with the dot notation. So div dot with style. Um, that's going to select all the divs that have a class of with style. Uh, if we simply have the dot class name, like dot worn, that will select any element whose class is worn, whether it's a div or a span or a, a paragraph or an H1, H2, it doesn't matter. And then lastly, um, with the ID, we have a pound sign and then, and then the ID name. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with IDs that you've probably already dealt with with JavaScript, right? One ID name per page, or it has to be unique throughout the entire page. Um, and so, you know, we could see how those are rendered. So different parts of the paragraph, um, these are all P elements, uh, but the styles are applied differently depending upon the class names and uh, uh, IDs. Okay, and we just talked about IDs. Um, you, yeah. so, there, so we have element names, we have class names, we can use IDs. We can also have contextual selectors, and that's where uh, we have our declaration of a, it's basically a space-separated list of, uh, of selectors, in this case of, of element names. So here we have li space em. So this means that these style rules will be applied to all EM elements that are contained within LI elements. So these are our contextual selectors. So, the, um, so it's really the EM within the context of an LI. And so if we take a look at this, um, emphasize text outside of the list, uh, don't have that style applied uh, within the list they do. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind that this is any, anywhere within. So if we go back to thinking of our markup as a kind of a tree, we have our HTML as the outermost, we have our head, we have our body, we kind of um, have our well-formed markup within there. So uh, this does not have to be a direct child of LI. It could it be basically any sort of descendant as long as it's contained within that LI open, LI closed, any EM within there that style will be applied to. Uh, so we have contextual selectors. Um, and let's see, so we've done, talked about element, uh, descendant, class, ID. We can use um, some more specific selectors as far as dealing with uh, child elements. And so there we, the, uh, the syntax is with the, the greater than sign. So body greater than P will be applied to all paragraph elements that are a direct child of body. If they're nested any further than that, it won't be applied. Uh, we can also select out attributes. Um, input type equals text, input type equals radio is the selector, and there's also a wildcard selector. Yes? Um, I know that at least at some point, uh, I did not support child very well or at all. Do you know what's a good right. resource for Yes, um, somewhere in this, uh, somewhere in the list of slides, and we'll come across it. Uh, there are charts of these things uh, that basically have all of the CSS properties and then the, the major versions of the browsers, and they'll tell you if it's supported, not supported, or if it's quirky or buggy. And, and that that is a good point. So, um, child attribute and wildcard, those are definitely more recent in terms of their appearance into the CSS specs. Um, and so the uh, rendering of those current day browsers, modern versions of IE, Netscape, Safari, Opera, um, I'll, I'll venture to say no problem, um, or very few. Uh, you go back one generation and all those, you're probably going to encounter some issues. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need the text or radio in quotes? Uh, uh, not, not with CSS, you're right, yeah. Yeah, I prefer the quote syntax, but they didn't ask me. Yes. David, do I have repeating the questions? Oh, yes, thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Can you explain the wildcard? 
Oh, uh, can I explain the wild card? Yes. Um, so the wild card would basically apply to uh, any element uh, that, that would match any element. So, um, and, and there are some specific cases where something like that would be useful as opposed to just saying body and then, and, and then a list of rules thinking that, well, everything's contained within the body, right? Um, but but in, some, in some cases, the wild card is, is, is useful. Um, so the question, why would why would you have star space HTML as a selector? I have I offhand I don't know. It could it could be a work yeah. Whenever you see odd things like that, it's often the case of that you're trying to work around um, some quirk in some browser. It, it it could be HTML star right that might be that or it could be it could have been a comma list of HTML comma body comma star I mean, you know, who who knows um, but but often kind of strange things like that are due to kind of browser quirks and workarounds um, and you all have dealt with JavaScript so you sort of know what some of that's like um, okay so inheritance. Um, Properties are typically inherited by the child elements. Okay? Um, and so, for instance, if we put a navy background on the body, then you know, everything within is, uh, is going to inherit um, that. Or I, sh I shouldn't say background, I should say color. Um, it's, it's actually so here's a case where, well, let's just take a, take a look at the style elements a little more closely. So, we're saying, okay, everything in the body, we want navy. Uh, um, anything within an EM, we want red. Anything within a div, we want green. And our markup is such that we have a body, we have a div, we have an EM within the div, and then uh, we have, as a sibling of the div, we have the paragraph. And so if we take a look and see how that's rendered, um, we have a screenshot of it here. So our div is green, the em within is red, and then write the paragraph that we didn't have a specific style rule applied to um, inherits from the body. Okay. Um, as our CSS gets more complicated, it can be very difficult to determine where exactly these style rules are being set. Um, I don't know, has, has uh, David talked about Firebug? Okay, so Firebug will be your friend when it comes to CSS, uh, without a doubt. And so you can basically look at the HTML. It will show you a list of all the rules, uh, all the style rules, uh, where it's inherited from, what's, where, where things are being overridden. So um, Firebug uh, is be, it's fantastic. It's fantastic for JavaScript. It's a really an indispensable uh, tool for the web developer. Uh, so we have this funny name, Cascading Style Sheets. Well, where does the cascade come from? And uh, it, the idea is that you know, these, uh, the style sheets sort of cascade down, and these the rules cascade down. And it turns out we can have a lot of different um, inputs into how something's styled. And in, in the end, we might have con some conflicting rules, um, and we have to have ways of resolving which ones apply. Uh, there's a, a really good part of the spec um, in CSS 2.1, assigning property values, cascading, and inheritance. If, if you want a thorough understanding of that, it's a good, a good, place, to, uh, good place to start. So we basically will look at three different things. Um, one is the style sheet origin. Where does the style sheet come from? Uh, the second thing we'll look at in terms of resolving right, which, which rule sort of wins out, the specificity of the selector. And then lastly, we'll look at the, there's a, an order as well. Um, hopefully, we don't rely, have to rely on the order um, because orders can, uh, possible for orders to uh, change just in the editing process. Uh, and so ideally, we want to uh, make sure we get the styles and the look we want based upon these other ones. So where do style sheets come from? The content provider um, can provide a style sheet via the, uh, the link element, 
via the script elements, uh, right, via import statements. The reader can supply a style sheet as well. Okay, so when you set preferences, make your fonts really big, make them small, um, in a sense, you're altering style sheets. And this is a fairly simple um, demonstration of that. It might be that if you have um, uh, difficulties reading on a screen, you might have a high contrast white on black, black on white style sheet that you apply. Okay, and so there are, are some um, where the reader uh, will sort of supply rules for the style sheet. Lastly, there's the UA or the user agent. Uh, this is kind of the, the technical term for web browser style sheet. And so, um, and so right by default, if you don't give any style rules, um, there is a way that the browser will render a web page. Um, you know, and I think we're all sort of used to that, right? H1s are going to be bigger than H2s. Paragraphs typically have a space for them. List items are typically indented with bullets. All of those types of rules come from the uh, kind of default user agent style sheet. Um, so, and, and, and typically the style sheet origin typically goes from, start with the, the user agent style sheet, then the reader has priority, and then the author has priority. Um, we can also look at the specificity of the selector. And that is, so in our, in our selector that we have, we count up the ID attributes. And the more ID attributes you have, the more specific it is. And that makes sense, because the ID only occurs you know, once. It's, it's unique throughout the entire page. Um, so that's why, like, if you have a, a header and a footer and navigation that only occurs once on a page, you typically give it an ID, and that way you can write styles to it that you know are going to be far more specific than general style rules you have about paragraphs or lists or whatever in the content of your page. Um, so count the IDs. If the IDs... Um, uh, more, more IDs will, will sort of win out. Nextly, we count class attributes. If we can't make a distinction uh, based upon counting the IDs, we count the class attributes. And then, and then lastly, um, if we still need to kind of a tiebreaker, if you will, uh, we count the element names in the, in the selector. And then lastly, if we can't do any of that, then basically the last occurrence of, of um, the rule will override uh, previous setting of the rule. The, the, yes, yes, the last, the last rule. So yeah, so basically if you um, right, visualize your CSS and basically bring them in in one huge document, you know, um, as, it, as it's been brought in by style and link and import and all that, you know, the last one will sort of win out. Um, here's, um, here's a slide of the cascade in action. And I'm kind of pausing right now because when I've, when I've done this in E12, we kind of have a little game and we, people, different people play different parts of the style sheet. And I, it can be, it's, it's really a lot of fun, um, but it does take some time. So I'm going to skip over that uh, for now and trust that you can kind of go back, look at this, figure out what's going on. If you can't figure out what's going on, um, which you may not be able to read, Right? Assigning property values, cascading and inheritance first, and then take a look and, and see what's going on. But it's really all about figuring out the specificity, right? Look at IDs, look at classes, um, you know, count up the, the different element names. And you can kind of, uh, you'll be able to, to see how, how that works. The other thing I'll note too, that in all these examples, Typically, after the source, uh, there's two links here. There's one kind of with style, so you can kind of see it with CSS. And um, you obviously can just turn CSS off if you have um, Firebug or, or something else. But there's also a link that renders the same markup without CSS to kind of help, uh, help see those side by side. OK. I think another useful exercise um, is to go take a look at and these are kind of example, sample default CSS style sheets uh, for HTML4 and if you go way, way back for HTML2. And how many were around to see HTML2? 
be honest. Okay, there's okay, three, four, five folks. Some people are raising their hand proudly, others rather sheepishly. Um, I understand both. So, um, th so th this will kind of give you a, a sense of kind of a, what the default display is for a web browser. Um, and you know, I think it's useful to start with HTML2. It's a lot simpler. Uh, and you can kind of see what, um, what the, the default rules are uh, and see how those are, uh, see how those are applied. So if we take a look and see what the, the CSS properties that are available to us, um, CSS1, we have 53 properties, um, and they're kind of all listed here. CSS2.1, we have 98, so you know, roughly double in terms of, of complexity. Um, and, and again, the specs are quite readable. Uh, you know, here's an appendix of all the properties. Right? They're all nicely interlinked, so you can go and figure out exactly what the spec says. Uh, so definitely want you to be aware of those. Okay, okay so we have, what, um, 93 to get through. The first one, um, and we're gonna cover these kind of um, rapid fire, and I won't cover all of them, uh, but I wanna kinda give you an idea um, and try to focus on ones that you're going to use the most often. So with font, Properties, we can set kind of the font family, the font style, font variant, font weight, font size. And then it's almost always the case that we have um, for things like fonts, for things like borders, for things like um, no, fonts and borders, let's stick with for now. Uh, we have shorthand ways of expressing all those properties kind of in one single statement. And those can be a, a convenient shortcut. So for font family, uh, again, we have this comma separated list uh, of things uh, that, that we talked about before. Um, and so we've applied, you know, the Garamon times serif to the first div, Arial Helvetica sans serif uh, to the second. Um, and then so we, the generic families that we have are serif, sans serif, monospace. Uh, technically, fantasy and cursive are also generic, but you, uh, I rarely see those. Um, font style lets us make things normal or italic um, and also oblique. And to be honest, I've tried, people that know fonts have tried to explain to me font and oblique, and I think I understand it at the time. Um, and then I walk away and it, it vanishes from my mind. So um, there is a difference. Um, but uh, I'm not going to be able to explain it to you. Font variant, um, we can do kind of normal small caps. Uh, and of course, why would we want to say normal? Well, if we have a, a, the style where we've made something italic and we want to, and that's being inherited and we want to revert back, that's what would simply create a style where we explicitly set that to normal. Font weight, uh, so the spec is actually gives us a lot of flexibility of setting the boldness. Um, in, in reality, the, the browsers, we have font weight uh, bold or normal, um, but the spec kind of gives us you know, nine, nine levels of, of gradation from 100 to 900. Uh, but in practice, we have font weight bold or font weight normal. Um, and that's sort of the CSS way of making things bold. With the sizing of fonts, uh, there's a lot of, there's uh, many different ways of, of setting the size of things. And that's going to be true with other things too. There's a lot of different ways to express units within CSS. And uh, a lot of that's good to have that flexibility. Um, and it just kind of makes it a little more, a little more complicated. But we have uh, kind of relative sizes um, by name, okay, um, extra small, extra, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, extra, extra large. So it's sort of like you're shopping for t-shirts. Um, and, and those are relative to the user agent default. Okay. Um, we can have s sizes relative to the context. Okay, okay so if I'm, at a, uh, if I'm inside of a paragraph, and 
say the the um, font size, the calculated font size of that paragraph is 14 point, and then I could do you know span, style, um, font size equals smaller, font size colon smaller, and then that would make starting at that calculated value of 14 point would would make that probably about 80 percent smaller. Uh, so anyway, so smaller, larger, relative to the context of where you're at. Um, also relative to the context is, is a unit in terms of percents or in terms of this EM unit. And the EM is, is the length of, of, a, of an M uh, in that font. Uh, so 0.8 and 80% roughly the same thing. Or 0.8 EM and 80% going to be roughly the same thing. We can also use absolute units um, in terms of points. In general, it's uh, best to use relative sizes in CSS, uh, whether we're talking fonts or anything else. And, and basically because if you, if you go from device to device, um, you, know, you don't want to set 18 point on a small device, uh, but you could set extra large. Okay. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're on a desktop, 18 point might look fine, uh, but extra large will also work. Um, and so, in general, to be friendly to devices, to be friendly to user settings, the, these relative sizes uh, are almost always the way to go. So here we just go through some examples where, where we set the font size by name. We see the effect here. Um, you know relative names so we make things smaller or larger um, and just kind of go through the various things we can set to use absolute units. Um, one thing I definitely encourage you all to do that as you're getting used to CSS just kind of play with things um, and see what happens when you change things. And uh, I, I always like to change things to an extreme. Don't, you know, don't take a little tiny, take a huge step and oh, okay and then kind of, kind of throttle back. If you kind of make little tiny changes sometimes it's, it can be hard to um, Hard to see exactly what's going on. Um, so we talked about uh, relative and absolute. Um, we talked about how relative almost always better than um, absolute sizes. One thing to keep in mind that relative sizes um, will be, uh, I should say, we need to keep in, in, in mind inheritance when we deal with relative sizes. So for instance, um, if we have a div and we have a style rule that says div font size 80% okay, or 85% and if our, um, and so we said a, if we're shrinking the font size 15% each time, we also have another rule where we have the left margin to be 20 pixels. As we nest the divs, okay, that 85%, 85%, that's multiplied together. And the divs, of course, the left margin is going to be added up so that we can kind of see that we quickly, um, you know, our margin moves in 20 points each nesting, and our font size is 85% of the containing div. Um, and so we just need to keep that in mind uh, as we use relative sizes. Yes. Yeah. At the top of that page, that's where it says margin left, that should be 20px, not 50px, is that right? Um, right there. Yes, yep, yep, margin left should be 20px. Okay, I'll get that corrected. Um, right, yes, we're setting a, a margin of 20. Or, yeah. again, for regular monitors, not exotic devices, mm -hmm. when you say points, are we thinking mm -hmm. of 72 points to the inch, you, 96 pixels to the inch? Um, yes. Yes, that's usually what happens. Um, so here, yes, here I'm expressing it in terms of pixels, um, which, yeah, you'll probably, you'll typically get 96 um, pixels per inch and 72 points per inch. Um, if I wanted to do this, perhaps I should have, you know, made my left margin of like, 1.5 EM or 2 EM, um, you know that might, that would be a, a more of a, a better relative way of doing that. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
uh, a point is an actual standard measurement that has a uh, physical representation relative to an inch, but a pixel is relative to the resolution of your screen, isn't it? And pixels change well, by inches. Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah and that, that's why. Yeah, I mean, dealing dealing with pixels is going to be um, is, is going to be almost is going to be tricky. Um, but you know, you also, I mean, images on your web page are have pixel values as well. So you you kind of have to deal with that. But yeah, you're right. Depending upon the depending upon the, the resolution, right? The the, pic, the pixels will be different physical sizes. Um, so lastly, we have a font shorthand property, and that lets us set all of these things in one declaration. Um, so the font style, the font variant, the font weight, font size, the line height, and the font family. And if we take a look at those, and, and hopefully you can kind of read through that, right? The pipes are ors, uh, square brackets, group things, question mark means that it, it may or may not be present. Um, and so if, if we only want to set the font size, we could do, you know, um, we could do font size 120 percent, and then and then a, a font family if we wanted to. Uh, we can go through and set set all of those explicitly if we want to, but um, we can leave some of those out, and the rule can, uh, can still be unambiguous and be interpreted. Uh, so often you'll see kind of the shorthand property if you just want to set uh, set everything at once. Again, my recommendation until you're quite comfortable and quite used to this. List them out one by one, uh, and that way you'll just kind of uh, it'll be a reminder as to exactly what you've you've done. Um, Time-wise, why don't we go ahead and take a break, and then we'll get back and we'll talk about text properties and some more uh, positional types of CSS. So we'll take about uh, probably a ten-minute break or so. Are we? We are on. Okay. So I think in the interest of getting to some. Um, what I'll consider a little more more interesting CSS uh, issues. Um, I'll, I'm going to uh, breeze through some of these slides. Um, so here's a, a list of some various text properties. You can control word spacing, letter spacing, um, text transformation, alignment, indentation, line height, and of you know of various uh, various samples here um, that that we can do with. Controlling text properties. When we deal, um, I mentioned the, the font units in CSS. Um, if we're dealing with length, length, I should say, um, we have the, again we have the EM unit, uh, and then uh, so basically, you know, one EM unit is going to be the length of a of an M in that uh, whatever the calculated font size. We have points. We have the EX unit, um, millimeters, centimeters, inches, pixels. We can deal in percentages. When we have URLs, we actually have the URL parentheses, and then the absolute or, UR, or relative URL goes inside there. With um, with color units, we can have um, colors by name, um, rarely used uh, RGB color, um, and, and then we can also use uh, hexadecimal color if if we want as well. Uh, so a lot of different um, flexibilities uh, there. Various ways of setting uh, colors. I'm going to assume that you've already dealt with colors in some fashion or another, and know all about the web safe color palette and things like that. One of the key things I think to understanding um, aspects of CSS is to understand this block model. Um, and within this this block model, uh, because basically as the the Rendering engine applies and builds your page. This is what it's calculating. So, um, any sort of block level um, element or, or uh, element on the page, uh, you know, falls under this block model. So we have a height and a width to that model, um, to, to that block, and then the space. Uh, we have the border here. Okay, so height uh, and width. The space between the where the content ends and the border begins, that's the padding. And, and again, there's um, you know, padding on the top right, bottom left, border on the top right, bottom left. 
Um, and then the space between the border and uh, sort of the outside edge is the margin of the block. Um, and so the idea that if we have another block on that page, it could go up to that border, or uh, I shouldn't say to the border, right, to the, to the edge of the block where the margin specified, but not encroach um, any further. Uh, so we can set, control all these things. We can control the margin, we can control the border, uh, control the padding um, as well. And again, Firebug shows you what that calculated block model is. So you can see the pixel measurements um, of that. So you can tell the height and width of the content. You can see where the padding is. You can see you know, where the margin is, things like that. So again, Firebug is a very, very useful tool. Um, we can set, again, the top, right, bottom, left, um, margin, padding, and border separately. Um, and we can set various things uh, about those. We also have shorthand properties to set uh, the border, to set the padding, and to set the margin as well. Um, for the shorthand margin and padding, um, if you remember the trouble uh, mnemonic, uh, top, right, bottom, left. Uh, and if we only set, if we don't set all four, then basically whatever is missing will be filled in by a previous. So in the case of the top rule here, we've set um, top margin, um, right, bottom, and left. The second example, we've set the top and the right. We haven't set a bottom, so the top um, will be, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the padding for the bottom will, will be the same as the top, and the padding for the left will be the same as the t padding for the right. Uh, uh, this slide shows various border styles, okay, dotted, dashed, outset, inset, all these different things in different colors. Um, and none as well. Um, the borders will appear slightly differently on different browsers. Um, and here we're showing the uh, shorthand property for setting the border. So here we're setting border thin, dotted, and then a color. Okay. Um, again, thin, medium, thick, these are all names. We, they could be in terms of pixels. Um, uh, kind of setting those. So here's an example um, where we are, we have two blocks of, on our page. Um, one, we are setting the border, setting the background color, um, and also setting the width to be 33%. Okay, so they're both divs. Um, one has a class that's called about, and then the other div is just uh, the, the content. And so we're applying these particular styles to the about div. Okay. So we're basically kind of, instead of 100%, we're shrinking it down to 33, giving it a border, giving it some padding and margin to separate it from outside content. And we'll get back to this, um, back to that example when we talk about floats. As far as backgrounds go, right, we can set background color. But we can also set background images. Um, background images, we can... Uh, have a lot of flexibility uh, with those as to how they tile or how they repeat in the uh, x direction and the y direction. We can have them repeat, we can have them not repeat. We can fix them uh, so that they don't scroll uh, with the page. Um, okay. So here's a, uh, the background image, here's just a single shield. And we, we are repeating here in the x direction, in the y direction, and uh, it's also scrolling. The example where we um, repeat solely in the y direction, okay, so now we no longer have the repeat in the x direction. Uh, we can also take that same background image and um, center it and don't repeat it in x or y and fix it. Okay, so here we have a single image in the middle of the page and as we scroll it stays fixed. I'm sorry, is this, is this 
Well, so, so the CSS, the properties that we set, right, just these textual rules that we have here. Um, but then the, the CSS rendering engine is part, of, is part of what the browser does, right? So whatever, um, so along with, the, you know, your, your browser is going to have some, some CSS rendering engine that's going to be responsible for, you know, taking this markup, taking all the rules, figuring out what needs to, what needs to happen. So... Um, even before CSS, right, we could put uh, background images on web pages, um, at least on the entire page. With CSS, we can apply backgrounds and background images to certain elements as well. So here I have three elements, um, or three images, uh, water, marble, and uh, wood, and create some nested divs here and simply apply... Um, uh, apply those image URLs to the background of those different divs with the different classes. We can see how that turns out. With background images, this is one um, main way that we kind of bring in images that are presentational and design oriented in nature. Um, and so here's an example where we have um, the markup, which is just the, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we have an H1 element. And then, so the idea here is that um, we have an H1 element that's inside of a div whose ID is, is U.S. title. So we have a style rule for that div, and we include a background image in there. Um, and then, likewise, we want to offset. Um, well, actually, in this case, I'm sorry, we aren't offsetting yet. That comes later. Um, and so, this is a way to begin to bring visual components into our page solely using CSS. So, there's no image element directly on the page. Uh, we've just chosen to style our heading in a particular way. And we can kind of see how that works. Okay. So we can also use um, kind of the tiling of an image um, and take advantage of the size to um, kind of have some, some interesting effects and to kind of also safeguard against uh, differences of, of font sizes. So here, um, here the idea is we have a table, um, and in our header of our table, we kind of want to offset that. We could put a background color. In this case, we have a kind of a gradient effect. And we're going to use, uh, use an, an image uh, to achieve that. So here's our initial image. It's 5 pixels wide, um, 150 pixels tall. So we're going to set, we want to tile it in the x direction, but not in the y direction. And we also want to make it much, much bigger, taller than we have really ever expect it to be used. And that way, if we increase our font size um, many fold, then right, we, the, 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 the top of that image you know, just kind of be, uh, comes into view like that. You see this type of, of effect uh, used quite a bit with backgrounds if you want some, some blend of an image into a background. Um, and because we can control the XY tiling, uh, things like this are, are very, uh, very achievable. And so this, uh, this is the, an example. So as we go up, now you can see if we go up and up, you know, eventually we can kind of break this. Um, but, but we never kind of start to retile the image in a Y direction at least. And we can make it fairly large and still sort of retain the initial intent of that. Okay. And that's often how some of these gradients are achieved. And again, the nice thing about that, we didn't have to turn the text into an image uh, for that. We just had to turn, we just had to have a background image and, and have text and then the background image with the right tiling. Um, so this being Patriot's Day, um, we can, uh, and this is a, kind of a, used an example from uh, Eric Meyer's website. Um, 
he sort of had this done in a, in a spacewalk motif, but um, did this with the, um, the Minuteman statue. And, and let me just show you what, what it looks like first. Um, so here's, the, uh, here's how it looks. <clears throat> and there are three images involved here. And they're shown in, uh, up, up top here. So we kind of have the regular photograph. We have kind of a washed out photograph. And then we have one that um, is deep blue. And the idea with this is that we, we have our divs on our page. And we, um, so the main background gets the photograph. The background that has the header, the Concord Hen by Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, that gets sort of the blue div background. And because these are placed one on top of another, right? they all still line up. Um, and then, then the text, uh, the background for that is, is the washed out uh, image. Um, and so we kind of have a fairly neat effect. And if you look at the markup for this, very, very straightforward markup. Uh, we had divs, h1s, h2s, and paragraphs. The full copy of all three images is, is being loaded, yes. Um, it's just that, so the, uh, take, take, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the div that has the main, the main text, uh, which has sort of the, the light uh, image. So that div um, is only covering that part of the page. So even though um, the background for that div is, is there, that div right, doesn't cover uh, the rest of the page, and that's why the background of the main page shows through. The question is, uh, isn't that kind of slow? Um, you know, it depends how big your image is. I mean, you're using three images. Um, it could be slow if they're, if they're really, really large, um, but it's usually not, not a huge issue. Yeah, Eric. So, um, but when you are placing those background images, those are outside of the page, Yes, they are. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, so you're right. So, if we look at the at the rules, um, we are setting the background right. Um, first of all, we're fixing them, not repeating them, and we are setting the left and right position of those. Yes. For that particular class, the x and y position is not relative to the origin of that element that has that class. Correct. What? Oh, sorry. Um, so the question is, um, so even though the x and y is set, um, it's set in a in an absolute way relative to the entire page um, and and yes uh, that is the case uh, there are there would be ways of specifying relative to the current position but that's just not shown here um, there are also um, pseudo classes and pseudo elements and, and these let us kind of access um, parts of the page and, and have selectors uh, or apply classes uh, to things really based upon their either position or behavior. So for instance, um, there's a pseudo class for links and a uh, visited link and an active link and a hovered link. Um, there's a pseudo class for focus, which is like a, a text area on focus event when you've clicked into it. Um, and so you could uh, style a focused element differently uh, than something else. Uh, and the syntax for that is the pseudo element, the pseudo class name or pseudo element name, uh, colon, and then the, the pseudo class or the pseudo element. And so this lets us do things like um, you know, pseudo, the, the pseudo element for the f first letter, um, first line, right? We can make in uh, small caps here. 
Um, it's used a lot with, uh, with images. I'm sorry. It's used a lot with links. Um, you often see A colon um, links, A colon hover, A colon visited, uh, A colon active. Um, and as a way to style the, uh, style the links uh, often differently. Okay. One thing with class names, um, be somewhat careful about how you choose those. Um, the idea that is, if, if you can look at a class name and understand how it's styled, then it's probably a bad class name. That's, um, you know, so you know, given given something a class of thin border, um, probably not a good thing. Um, so you want to make your class names really semantic in nature uh, and based upon the page, based upon the, uh, the markup and the role that that's playing in that page. I have seen cases where, you know, a class red bold is styled not red and not bold. Um, that may, it may start out that way and as you work with the content and as you work with the client and the designs, it may turn out to be something totally different. So just stay away from um, b being able to uh, deduce the uh, styling from the class name. It also um, can be bad too. So if you want something red bold, uh, you might you you might want to style something red and bold in two completely different contexts. And later on, you might decide you want to change one context. And if all you have is a red bold class, you're going to have to change it for all contexts. And so that's why you always go back to the to the semantics of uh, of things. And that way you can style things differently. So for instance, you know, you might want to um, apply classes to thumbnails on your site, um, which are different from images uh, on your site. And that way you can control the margins, the padding, the borders uh, differently for those two things. Okay, float. Um, typically, um, an image displayed in a paragraph. It's kind of displayed in line. Here's a little thumbnail of a, the 777, followed by some text. The left side shows the default uh, rendering of that. If we take the float property and say float right, okay, um, we're going to take that image, float it over to the right of the containing block. Okay. The text it's going to kind of in the, um, it's going to be really kind of taken out of uh, of the of the block model as far as spacing goes, so the text will move up beside it, like we see on the right hand. So a couple things to note: a float really takes it out of the position, and that lets the other um, parts of your content move up into that area. The second thing, we can only f float typically, um, the float always happens within the containing block, okay? um, not within necessarily the, the page. So when we float something to the left or to the right, it's always within the context of the containing block. Okay. So here's an example um, to kind of keep um, experimenting with float. We have three images this time. And if we take a look at our markup, the images come one right after the other, and then we have the text of our paragraph. Now, if we take those images and we float to the right, um, and, and basically just take the default for this clear um, attribute. So the first image floats to the right. That's fine. Second image floats to the right it runs in to the first image. Third image floats to the right, it runs into the second image. Okay? And then the text flows up um, to kind of, kind of fill, in those, uh, fill in the remaining space that's left. So um, if we don't want things <clears throat> um, to float to the right of us, if, if we're now taking on the uh, 
personality of, of the uh, element, then that's when we can use the clear property. We can clear right, we can clear left, and we can clear both. Okay. So in this case, the clear right is saying, you know, I don't want any images, or I should, not images, basically the, no floating things to the right of me. Um, and so when we apply the clear right, first image floats up, goes to the right of the containing block. Second image floats up, um, to, and, but we said clear right. Okay, so it's going to move down here. Third image is going to come up, clear right, and it's going to go down there. And then once all those three images have floated to the right, had the proper clearing, and then the text comes up beside it. Yes? So the effective uh, clear attributes are the ones on the second and third images in this case? Yes, the clear, uh, um, repeat the question, thank you. Um, the, the effective clear properties are on the second and third image, and yes, that's, and that's correct. And have gotten the same effect by applying a clear left on the first two images? The, you would not have gotten the same effect by applying a clear left on the first two images. Why not? Because there's nothing floating to the left of those images. Okay. So, um, and, and so this important. So when the, the clear right, as this image is f floated, um, float right, clear right. So it's floating to the right, and it's also saying that it doesn't want any floated. Um, blocks to the right of it. But if you put a clear left on that first image, wouldn't that keep the next one from floating up next to it on its left? It's not saying clear to no. clear things to the left of me. It's saying don't put things with the value of float left to the right of me. Right, so that, that's a, a, a good perspective. So the, the clear property is, it, it's really saying, um, it's, it's really sort of forbidding um, where floated blocks are going to be relative to, uh, relative to that block. So it's not saying clear right doesn't mean I forbid anything floating to be um, Let me think. <clears throat> uh, no, I've lost my train of thought. Um, it's clear. Le okay, so clear right isn't going to prevent things from floating to, uh, but but it will prevent you from having things on the right that's floated. But if you apply clear left to the first image, the, you try it. Go go. Go try it. I don't want to. I don't want to sit here and, and spend the rest of the time arguing. You you can try it, and it won't work. <laughs> so basically, clear right means you can't have a float right. You could have a float left. Yes, you could have a float left. So if you had clear left there instead, you couldn't have a float left, but you could still have a float right. Yes. Um, I. I think so. So if you had, um, so do I have one of these where? For instance, if we had if if we had to apply to the second image a float left, where would that be? It would be over in this corner, perfectly happy, perfectly fine. And the text would be in the middle. And the text would be in the middle, exactly. Now, if we applied what would happen if we applied a clear to the text? If we had a clear right to the text, the text wouldn't float up against it. The text would would be clear to those images and it would start down here. Okay, there's more. Okay, and this might help. So, um, okay, so clear property defines the size of the block where floated blocks cannot occur. So here we have a clear of, of uh, none. And let's look at the markup because I've changed the markup slightly. So here we have three paragraphs, one, two, three. Each paragraph has its own thumbnail image. Okay. Okay. And if we take a look at the style, um, 
for the image, right, we, we're going to float to the right, clear um, the default value is going to be none. If we take a look at the top screenshot that does that, so our images are going to float to the right within their containing block. The containing block in this case is the paragraph. Now it turns out that the image is bigger, right, longer, taller than the paragraph text is. And remember, one of the things about floating, we float to, uh, within the containing block, but we also sort of take it out of the block calculation. Okay. So is what happens then in our second paragraph, the float right, okay, it basically runs into that first image because it hangs down past, that, past its containing block. Likewise, the third paragraph, when we float right that image, it's still within the paragraph containing block, but it runs into the second image. Okay. So when we apply a clear right and what do we have to apply a clear right to? We apply it to the paragraph. Okay. Then we get, uh, we get kind of the, the second screenshot. So clear right applied to the paragraphs and to point here, the important thing is that it's applied to the second and third paragraph. The clear right to the first paragraph is, is irrelevant in this case. So clear right says, okay, to the right of me, I'm not going to allow right, a floated block. So instead of running into the image, it, it will move down. Um, so it's clear on the right and there's no floating blocks to the right of it. And that's we can get this effect, yes? What would be the syntax for specifying that you don't want things to float on either the right or the left? Clear both. Clear both. Yep, so the, the clear both, clear left, clear right. Yep. Okay. Okay, so here's an example. So th that was an easy example with the images because the images have implicitly really a height and a width. Okay. We go back to our paragraph where we have the um, declaration of independence and we have our little about paragraph and we float it off to the right. The, the code looks exactly the same as we saw before except we're floating to the right, text comes up around it. The reason this works is that we set the width of that to be 33%. So when we go floating things around, we, uh, we always need to specify a width or else we're going to get ourselves in trouble. When we first looked at that with images, the images have an implicit height and width. Uh, so we didn't see that. So here we set the width, float it to the right, the text comes up. If, yes? If you wanted to float an image or a text box in the center of an element, how would you do that? If you wanted to, well, uh, the question is, how would you float an element to the center? And you couldn't. Now, now you could position it, an image into the middle, but that's not really floating. So you can float left, you can float right. Um, and so probably the way to achieve that would be to have an, an image uh, probably as a background and set, that, set the property to be center. <coughs> Right, but that's not really the, the floating. Because the thing with the float, it does, it does take it out of that block model calculation. Um, we can take the same thing, float left, um, and kind of get the same effect. Um, we can also, right, as someone asked earlier, we can float left and float right. Okay. So this just shows kind of a, a footer. So instead of using a table where we have a table cell, we have two paragraphs. We float one left, we float one right, and we have the same visual effect. Um, okay. So here's um, what somebody was uh, asking a bit earlier. What happens if we take, take one block float to the right, take one block float to the left? What happens to the text that's sort of beneath it? 
will kind of come up uh, into the middle. So here we have three paragraphs. Um, we set the width for the first and second paragraph, float those right, float those left. The third paragraph then will come up into the middle. And this is the beginning of, right, if you want to have a, a page where you have kind of a middle um, content, left column, right column, this is the beginning of that. Um, what's not shown here, I guess what, what this doesn't happen when, we, when as soon as we've cleared um, the height of our floated blocks, then we go back to really taking up the full space that's allotted to us. So if we don't want that to happen, a technique we can use is we still float right the first paragraph, float left the second paragraph, and these, uh, the, the things that were floated left and right have, have explicit widths set on them. So then with this middle column is what we can do is we can set the left margin and the right margin accordingly to those widths so that it kind of stays in the center column like we have here. And so this is really the same example that we saw above, but is what we've done is our third paragraph, we've set the left and right margin to be 35%. So that's the way to begin to achieve some of that, yes. Is there any way to do that without building in magic numbers like that? Is there any way to say P dot third has margins that are relative to the widths of the others? Would you need to go one level up and, and use some generating language? You'd probably, yeah, need to use some generating language. And that, that's one issue with CSS in general. So for instance, if you have like color schemes, you know, even if you have a, only a handful of colors in your document, odds are that's going to appear lots of different times in your CSS. And, and from a CSS point of view, there's really no good way to define some constant and then reuse that throughout your whole thing. Um, so to really do that, you have to kind of go to some, some, a more templating system where you're generating your CSS through some process. So one thing we can do with this float, uh, we can begin to build um, kind of these, uh, what, I, what I'll call here flexible grids. Um, and so here's uh, some screenshots of some programs from Harvard at home. Uh, beneath it are, is a list of um, uh, screenshots of some Congress uh, members. Each of these pictures, along with the text, is encapsulated inside of a div. And that div is floated. Um, to the, I guess it would be floated to the left. I'm getting turned around here. And so basically, uh, they float left, float left until you run out of room, and then you just start again. Um, and that way, when you expand to the full screen, you know, you'll get, you'll get six people across. When you bring that in, you know, um, uh, basically the, the, the floated elements will basically just expand uh, to the space, and when, when they don't have that, they'll just kind of build again. And so this is kind of a nice flexible way compared to a table where you'd have to say I need four columns or five columns um, to build this system. One thing to be careful of with this again is with the height is that you're going to want to specify not only a width but in this case a height because if somebody has a really long name say and you haven't accounted for that and they run three or four lines then it could very well be that as this next thing floats over, it's going to run into that div, and you're not going to have a nice, clean, complete grid. Uh, you're going to have some uh, odd things going on where, much like we saw with the, uh, the, the airplane images, when they kind of began to run into each other um, because they couldn't, couldn't clear one another. So if you're building a grid like this, just make sure height and width are set appropriately. And here's, a, here's an illustration of that. Um, here I've just taken images um, with little captions and, again, uh, set a width and floated them. And this top part, is, it's kind of a mess of things. But you can see where they've kind of floated left and then runs into the uh, horizontal, the, the vertical image, uh, continues on floating. 
So a fix to that is we just set the height and the width, and those are all nicely controlled, and we get a nice grid pattern. Okay. Um, the other property that comes in really handy with CSS is the display property. So we can display none, which means don't show it at all. We can display block, makes it into a block level display, and display inline. So here's, uh, and, and particularly with the display none, I think it's very, very powerful for building navigation. So on the left-hand side, here's the full list for uh, the American League, we see the East Central and West Division. And then we can basically if um, set the, what do I have, set the East and West, those list items, the display property to none. And so then we have, uh, have what's on the right. So what you can do is you can build, um, build navigation uh, and then based upon the, the setting the class names, uh, really determine what's going to be shown and what's not going to be shown depending upon you know, where the URL, where you're at, matches in, into that navigation. Um, and so you could choose to, to display some level of detail or, or none at all. Um, so this is just a simple, uh, simple embedded list here. Uh, we have IDs for the ALE, ALC, ALW. And then here we just set the ALE display property to none. And they just completely vanish from the page. Okay. With, um, gonna talk a little bit about uh, lists here. And we can control how lists are displayed uh, with a lot of granularity in CSS. Uh, here, we put little basketball images um, uh, with each list item. That may not be too interesting. But if you take a look and see what might have to happen if we didn't have that be a list, but we wanted to achieve the same effect without CSS, uh, it begins to look really messy. And we look at that, and that's really not a list anymore. Um, so we can almost always, if something's a list, we can code it and then mark it up to be a list, and then we can make uh, use CSS to render it in ways that we want it to. So one thing we can do, take a list, we can remove um, the list style. So we don't want the bullet, take the bullet away. We can then display that list in line instead of block level. Okay? So here we take our list, Big 12 Ivy League Pac-10, and we begin to turn it into some sort of tabbed navigation. And the main um, key to that is that we, it's that we take um, the list style and make it in line. Yes? Now, the, the one advantage to using the image elements instead of the list is that you've got an alt attribute on that image. If you're using the, mm -hmm. the image as an attribute in the CSS, and the image isn't there, or you've got a browser that's not loading images, right. what happens there? Well, you don't, um, so typically though bullets, images that are replacing bullets are, are presentational in nature and not content oriented. So the fact that, they, that there's no alt attribute should not be important. But you end up with nothing, you end up with the default. No, you'd end up with nothing. I mean, but, but the nice thing, it, it, to a, a browser, say, that's reading that, it would be a list. Um, and it, it could, it, uh, typically the uh, verbal browsers, it uh, can signal that it's reading the list, and it knows, you know, item one of three, item two of three. Um, and so the fact that it remains a list is, is very, very helpful. So... I want to show two more things with lists, um, and, and it all relates to, to navigation. Um, and so here's default styling of a list, and dress it up with CSS, and it, it begins to look like some, some navigation that we wouldn't be ashamed of putting on our, on our web page. And again, it remains, it remains a list. I'm not going to talk about the details of the, of the CSS. You can, um, you can take a look at that. 
but it's basically taking a list and then really just turning it into some navigation pane. Um, and this works with you know lists that are nested within lists, and we can use uh, you know CSS to control um, kind of the, the clamshell piece of things opening up, um, and and the display property to see how much of our clamshell is displayed um, and when and where. Um, we can also take nested lists and make them into breadcrumb navigation. Um, so here's a, a topic, drill down topic of, uh, from the Open Directory Project, top science, biology, genetics, genomics, pharmacogenetics, nested lists inside of one another, use CSS to build our breadcrumb navigation. And again, the list, they stay nested lists, um, but visually they appear as the breadcrumb. Okay, we have eight minutes left, and I'm going to skip media selectors. Other than to let you know that they exist, you can specify different style sheets for different media. The one that's commonly used is for print. Two screenshots here, one full-fledged web page, the other as that same exact web page is being printed out. So typically with print style sheets, you remove headers, footers, um, you know, make things black and white, make it ideal to print. And that can be a very, very nice thing. Now, I think is, is, they've talked about the, the UE, yeah. the grids, and the font reset. Not the grids, Not the grids. OK. Um, so, so the UE library, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Um, the reset font space, uh, all that can be can be very very handy. I use it sometimes, not necessarily all the time, um, but but for really setting things to a level where you know where you can begin to build up your own CSS, it can be very very effective. The grid piece to the to the UE um, is also really really handy. It basically defines certain um, grids and grid types. Uh, they can be flexible or fixed. You know, left column. Uh, middle, right, uh, at different percentages. And it can be a really, really good way to give the structure to your web page using CSS. And yeah, you could struggle with this on your own, and, and it might be a good exercise to do that. At the end of the day, though, my guess is you don't have the usability and testing budget that Yahoo does. Um, nor I venture to say the CSS skills that the team of Yahoo people do. You might come close, but uh, you know. And, and so these are really guaranteed to work, um, uh, you know, with all the major current generation browsers and fail fairly gracefully when you get to the older browsers. Um, and so there's a whole host of examples uh, they have. So you know, you can you know page width, uh, you, you use preset templates. Basically, they'll give you the markup then, refer to their, their CSS, and that gives the structure of the page. And then it's a matter of you providing the content and then the styling for what you want to go into the header, you know, the first part, the second part, and the footer. And uh, it can be really, really effective to do that. And so this, uh, you know, this shows a header, footer, kind of the main paragraph and then the right-hand column. And the, the font, um, the CSS reset is also applied here. So then, starting from this point, I have a um, kind of a, the baseline of the CSS. I'm not going to be tripped, but tripped up by any cell spacing and cell padding uh, that's in the default um, browser rendering. I have my page layout and markup, and I can begin to put stuff in the header, the footer, um, any navigation and any content that I want, and begin to apply my own style rules. Um, so basically, you know, this would be the, the type of structure that, uh, that, that you would get um, and begin to kind of work from there. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of those. I think they uh, really, really help. Um, you can walk through the Harvard homepage makeover uh, yourself, but it currently exists in a, a rather old state of HTML with virtually no CSS and went through the exercise of picking it apart and then putting it back together. Um, and if you look at the uh, kind of the comparison of the improvements, uh, 
in terms of markup size, uh, just the complexity of the markup, um, you know, the number of elements involved, the total page weight. Uh, so you can really gain a lot by paying attention to the, uh, to the CSS, separating out the markup from the presentation. Um, and I want to briefly go over a couple slides to kind of maybe give you a taste uh, of maybe things that you've already seen with respect to JavaScript and, and some that you'll see throughout the rest of the, the term. But so with JavaScript and with the DOM, right, you can manipulate all aspects of the web page. And this includes CSS um, properties. So here's, um, here's a page where, there we go, okay. Uh, by clicking, we're invoking some JavaScript that's changing the text alignment for a particular ID. We can show, we can hide, we can change the background color, okay. So again, these are, these are some very simple things that we're doing, but the principle is that we're using JavaScript to set uh, various CSS properties, okay, including, you know, things uh, showing or not showing on the page. And I don't know how much of that you've already done here, but we can do things like this, where we have a form now the markup, if we were to look at the markup, the markup has the full form that we're gonna see. There's no Ajax involved here at all, not yet. Um, but when we say, well, of course we want some ice cream, then uh, again, the CSS uh, via JavaScript, we, we set the display property here to block. Uh, and we see these different options that we can now choose um, how we want our ice cream. Um, and so again, that's all controlled uh, simply by toggling the display property of, of a particular div within this markup. Um, right. Uh, and kind of see that in lines five and seven here on those. We're just setting the, the display property. Now the other really powerful thing that we can begin to do with CSS in conjunction with JavaScript is to use things like uh, class names and IDs um, as kind of hooks for um, JavaScript functions to, in a sense, kind of latch onto and do some fairly sophisticated uh, presentational um, manipulations. Here's an example. Um, the, the underlying JavaScript library here is jQuery. Um, that little piece isn't, isn't necessarily that important. But take a look at the markup here. Um, the markup is very straightforward. We have, um, we have divs, okay. Uh, so we have a, a list, first of all, and a list really provides the um, uh, sort of the table of contents, if you will, or it will eventually provide the, the tab headers. And then we have divs. Each of these correspond back to, um, back to a list item. Okay. Um, so, so for this course refers to the basic div, which is right here, okay. Description refers to this div. So if we look at this without CSS involved, we see the web page here, we have the course information, course description, and schedule of lectures. That's great. Um, so if somebody doesn't have JavaScript, this is what they see. Now, using these divs, ID container, okay, um, class anchor for the divs, and let loose the uh, jQuery tabs plugin, which is specifically looking for, right, this, um, some of these names, or we tell it what names to look for. It basically will, can take that then and then turn it into this tabbed interface um, where the course's description and schedule show up, here we go, um, as tabs. Okay. And if we look at the source, you know, the, the source, the markup is just what we saw. It's just that sort of after the page loads, it's being manipulated by the JavaScript um, to render it in this tabbed formation. 
I'm going to show a couple more examples, but just to get kind of the concept of this, this unobtrusive JavaScript. So we, we have our page, we have the markup, we have various class names, and if we have JavaScript completely turned off, we still have something that's functional. It may not be exactly what we intended, but it's still functional. So here's an example where we're using the, the date picker plugin for jQuery, and, and all these JavaScript libraries will have some similar functionality. When I click inside of here, and that's not rendering well because I have my fonts really big. Um, when I click inside of here, up pops a little calendar widget uh, that I can then pick the date. And that's all triggered based upon the class name, input type equals text, class equals date. If I don't have JavaScript, what happens? Well, I still have a text input box, and I can instruct the person on the, the format of the date that they need to type in. Um, but again, it's, it's unobtrusive. I can have the page without JavaScript, it works fine. With JavaScript, it works great. And there's lots of things that you can do that. Tabs, date picker, um, and I'll let you look at the, uh, the ways of formatting slideshow kind of in a similar unobtrusive JavaScript way. But um, I'm a couple minutes past, so I apologize about that. Um, this has been great. Uh, really appreciate the invitation. Thank you, David. I really appreciate your uh, attention and your questions tonight. I'm happy to hang out uh, here for a bit. Uh, my train doesn't leave for another hour and 15 minutes, so I'm happy to talk to folks if, uh, if you want to, but uh, have a great evening, and thanks again.